Hey guys. Hello. How we doing? I'm amazing. Dan, how are you? Good. I like that new intro. We got that was new, by the way, Michael. That that little countdown. We That's had a different one. Really before. flashy. I like this new one. It was good. The numbers are big. It's nice. My oh, it gosh, was really the production value is just going <laughs> up and up and up here. It's so cool. Well, well hey, we should introduce Michael, by the way. We should. Um. Uh. So real quick, I'm Piper. I'm a mastering engineer. We're doing this thing called No Stupid Audio Questions with Dan. Bachi Galupi. Um, Dan and I have been doing this for almost a year now, Dan. It's been, it's been That's a minute. Awesome. Um, yeah, we first started uh, getting questions asked uh, in May of last year. So we have, wow. um, we have uh, over 100, not quite 200, but quite a lot of questions that uh, folks are asking anonymously um, in a nice safe space at tinystereo.com. I need and to go there now. Yeah, tinystereo.com um, and, uh, and of course through the musicexpo.co website. Um, and what we have uh, for you today is very exciting. We have Michael Pearson Adams from Waves Audio. And Michael is a great friend of mine and Dan's. And he is a producer and a director of education and, um, and uh, events and uh, getting the word out about all the great things that Waves does. And um, Michael, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. We're, we're glad to have you. I just love hanging. I heard that there was free drinks. There are, yes. There are. You had to provide your own. But... You have to provide your own free drink. But I know, we charge you to do it. Here. I'm Australian. I bring my own. There's no cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Music Expo um, format uh, and, and forum here is um, really a, is a good one because we get to have uh, folks from all walks of audio life um, of all skill levels and all disciplines um, that are here to ask questions of you um, in your discipline. And uh, Dan and I are really glad, glad to have you. Um, we have glad a to ton be of here. questions, ton of questions for you. So mm. Um, before we get started, uh, we have a couple of little announcements about um, future Music Expo events and things coming up. We have the Latin Music Summit um, that is happening June um, 11 and 12. Uh, go to musicexpo.co slash Latin Summit for that, uh, to sign up for that. That's going to be incredible. Um, uh, just seeing some of the list of presenters that they have is uh, making me want to block out my entire June 11 and 12 um, and, uh, and attend. Uh, also, um, I'm going to be hosting a mastering camp um, coming up soon. So just uh, go to the musicexpo.co website and um, check that out uh, and just uh, sign up for a little waiting list there um, so that we can get your, get your spot early. Um, Dan, Got Hello. any uh, got any things to say here? We're uh, uh, just just welcoming folks in. Not a ton. Just uh, <laughs> glad to be back. Sorry, I wasn't here last uh, last month. But thank you to Michael Meckling for filling in. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sh I heard. I mean, I didn't get to see it myself yet, but I heard that it went really well. So good job to that. Um, also. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to get all my plug-in questions answered. Um, could you remind us, Piper, of the three rules? Because I, oh, yeah. I, I, I've forgotten one of them. But uh, just to clear us up, three rules of no stupid audio questions. We have three rules here at NSAQ. Number one, have fun. Get yourself a drink. That's the one I forgot. Kick back. Hang out. We're supposed to have fun. This is supposed to be a, a fun hour-long uh, Q&A session. Number two, um, all questions are anonymous and it's a safe space. Um, there are no actual stupid audio questions. The, this, is, this was designed to um, basically create a forum for people to be able to ask questions that they might not know the answer to um, from searching on the internet, um, from various websites that will remain unnamed. Um, or for folks that, you know, should have learned something that is a, a basic um, audio fact in school and they just still don't know uh, what the, you know, what the background is for that particular thing. Um, and it's also for folks that uh, have a very specific question um, that, that we bring on a guest like Michael here uh, to answer. Rule number three, uh, Michael, in answering our questions, you are not allowed to say it depends. 
Fine you, with uh, that. <laughs> we we uh, we want to give real practical answers and practical advice for some of these questions because um, if you search anywhere on the internet, almost all the time you're going to get somebody that says. Uh, you know, it must be this way and doesn't give any actual background or, or information why, or someone that says, well, it depends on what you do, what you're going to do. So, um, you're not allowed to say Ah, that. now yes. I have context. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. There you go, Dan. You learned something too. Yeah, exactly. So I do, I do every time on this, <laughs> to be quite honest. So, um, we're going to have some fun. Yeah. We are going to have a safe space and, uh, we're never going to say it depends. So should, should we get started? Yeah. Should we throw Michael like just right under the bus right now with a, oh, with a yeah. plug in question? Well, it depends. Yeah. Okay, let's start him with a really difficult. Let's start him with a really difficult one. Um, Hi, Ray. So, <laughs> wait, is Ray here? Oh, hey, Ray. Hey, um, so um, <clears throat> the question is, uh, what all is involved when modeling a piece of analog equipment to make a plug in? What does that mean? to model a piece of gear. So so when you're modeling a piece of gear, there are a few things that you have to take into account. The first thing you have to take into account is what is it that you're actually trying to capture? Are you trying to capture uh, the character of a specific compressor or an EQ, or are you trying to capture uh, a vintage delay, or are you trying to capture the actual essence of a piece of gear that everybody has on their dream list, or are you literally trying to capture all those things? Now, through the years, we've fine-tuned the way that we actually model gear down to an absolute science. I remember how long it took us to actually capture the model of, say, for example, the SSL bundle, the SSL 4000 E and G channels, um, the, the the mastering bus and the EQ took a ton of time. Um, and then move forward a few years and we get to something like the Shep 73 and we actually managed to capture one little essence of that from uh, literally inputting a blueprint that Andrew Sheps found in one of his closets as, as an extra part of that. So cool. we what we do is we... There's the standard stuff, which I can talk about, which is you run a ton of signal through that piece of specific gear, whether it's a compressor or whatever it is. Um, you then capture uh, at every single possible frequency uh, uh, available, and then you do it again and again and again and again. And then you separate things like the actual structure of the hardware uh, from the characteristics of just running audio through the circuitry of the boards of that console or piece of gear or whatever it is. And then you make sure by Aing and being a ton and going back to, so for example, perfect example, API. When we modeled the API 560 and the 550A, etc., we spent a ton of time sending these models back to API, especially with the API 560 and the API 2500, uh, until, and we said, we're not accepting this until you guys can't instantly tell the difference. Hmm. Um, and the final release of the API collection was when the guys at API needed to listen to the comparison like about 15 times before they could really, really hmm. guess at telling the difference. So. Uh, we've gone through this milestone of education that uh, through the years used to take four or five years to now, depending on the model, can be done in as little as a couple of months uh, for the main part of it. But it's there's a lot that goes into it. A perfect example of one that's really, really affordable and ridic okay, ridiculously cheap. Um, but is probably one of the, my favorite models is actually a VI. Piper, am I talking too much? No, okay, good. All. Okay, not so uh, uh, Australian alcohol, talk a lot. Um, <clears throat> we have this plugin, um, which is a VI, and it's a grand piano, and it's a model of Freddie Mercury's old Fazioli grand piano, yeah. which sits at Metropolis. 
And we've actually got a video on of the basics of how we actually modeled that piano. And it took us, it took us quite a long time, but the results are just epic. Um, the other thing that goes into modeling a lot is you really have to pick and choose what you actually model. Perfect example of that is you model a 1073. There's going to be a lot of people out there who will be like, oh, every 1073 sounds different, etc. And they'd be dead right. So you have to actually make sure that what you're modeling, you, you decide well on exactly what you're going to model and you remind people that it's analog it's going to be different. Not every SSL 4000 same, sounds the same. Not every 1073 or, you know, uh, uh, you know, Pultec sounds the same. But it's the characteristics. So you have to decide what you're going to model. Was that an answer? Yeah, that, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, Absolutely good. Absolutely perfect. Um, okay, and uh, of course, you know, we're trying to answer as many as we can. So I'm going to hit you with another one right now. Can mastering be done on recording and mixing DAWs like Pro Tools, Logic, Studio One, or should you do mastering on specialized software like Wave Lab? No, I think it totally can be. Um, I think, and Piper, uh, I'm going to tell a joke. Pipe in whenever you want here. Um, uh, that was ad libbed too. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a DAW or any computer software should not be something that you're working for. You should always make sure that your DAW is working for you and you're not working for it. And one of the things about that that is an extension of that is you really have to know your tools to do anything, whether you're recording, making beats, mixing, or mastering. If you, wanna, if you know your tools, whether it's Pro Tools or Reaper, or um, you know, uh, Studio One or whatever, if you know your tools and you know what your compressors and your limiters and the tools that you have do, and you know when to apply them, then I see no reason why you can't use any DAW. Thank you. Totally. I, I would add to you just as, as one side note, you may need to have some additional software if you want to do mastering professionally mm -hmm. and you're using a DAW that, for example, can't make DDPs for CD replication, you may need right. some extra software to assist you, but there's nothing about the DAW that would keep you from working on the audio um, however you would like to. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think there's an awful lot, uh, and I see a lot of questions on the internet, uh, and that's why I'm glad that this forum exists. Somebody will ask something like that, and then somebody will laugh at the, at the question right. in social media. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, it, the question that just got asked is probably one of the most relevant questions, regardless of whether it's can you use any DAW to compose music to can you use any DAW to mix a record like Tony Maserati or can you master a record? Um, it's like if you know your tools... And you know what uh, you know what you actually have and how to use it. Then it's not a stupid question. It's a very very good question. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. You got um, one. I do. This one came in. This is actually an interesting one. And and honestly, <clears throat> I don't know how I'd answer it. So I'm curious to hear your both of y'all's thoughts. What is the difference between saturation and distortion? Quite a lot. Um, one, uh, and especially when you're talking about the different tools and the different companies. Say, for example, uh, we have a plugin or two that will literally add what we describe in the manual and in videos as a kind of warmth or saturation. Um, and what was the other one? Saturation or distortion? Distortion. distortion. Uh, distor I mean, distortion to me is. Uh, it's a distortion of the sound, so therefore it's uh, you're nearly destroying certain frequency parts of that sound, or intentionally clipping them, or just intentionally di unraveling them is probably one of my favorite terms. If I'm teaching um, distortion, yeah, yeah, that's that's the way I re remember. I remember I said this to a class once, 
at a university and I was like, shit, I got to remember that. Um, distortion to me is the unraveling of the sound at a certain dynamic range or a certain level um, that you pick or a certain threshold, whereas saturation can spread the sound. You have to be very, very careful with saturation or distortion, but especially saturation in my uh, opinion, because saturation can lead to um, a very unrealistic stereo field and perception, and it can also lead to a lot of mud. And it can, and but most importantly, a lot of saturation, if you're applying it to the entire mix, can lead to you not knowing where one instrument starts and another one finishes or how things are separated. It, it, so you can actually lose the space in a mix with saturation if you if you go too far. I, and I think one little additive on that is the time to add saturation or distortion is the day after you actually think about it. Because if you're thinking about it and it's 11 o'clock at night and you've been working on that mix for like five hours, your ears are not in a capable position to make a decision on whether it's going to sound good or not. That's interesting. Oh my god, that was a good answer. Cheers. <laughs> that was that really wow, was. That what was a very great thorough. answer. Wow. Okay, uh, I got one here. Um, boring <clears throat> question, but best software for encoding metadata for Windows. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Yeah, what is okay? I'm curious, Piper, because from my understanding is there is now there's lots of ways to encode metadata mm -hmm. onto files, but as as someone who delivers a lot of masters to various distributors and to record labels, let me just... Uh, you know, there is a fourth rule, which is mute your phone. You know, Are it's you funny. A, is that like the, the some video game that theme? Was, no, that was me calling my phone with my tile. Apparently I lost it, and then my tile called it from my pocket. So Quick quick um, shout out to Digi Sound Studio and James from Coffee Shop Studio, who <laughs> thinks it's nice to see my face on the screen again. You're too nice, wow. James. <laughs> Um, this is a safe space. Yeah, I got totally distracted. What were we just talking about? Uh, boring Sorry. question, but best software for encoding metadata. Oh, metadata, yeah. Windows. So, like, as someone who delivers lots of files to labels and to mm -hmm. distributors, they don't really seem to want any meta metadata on that file. Totally. Um, so yeah. I'm not really sure why you would why you would want to put metadata on the file, what the advantages to that, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I We do not get asked for that. Occasionally, maybe ISRC codes would be the only thing. And even those, I think, will get lost once that file is converted to whatever format uh, a streaming service wants to make. So there are, there are I'm not some, sure. There are some that will... Um... There, see, but they're not specifying what type of file. Right. So an right. ID3 or a FLAC can totally hold lots of metadata that people might want to have. Right. Um, but it looks like they're asking, you know, basically like for uh, some sort of a batch um, metadata editor. Um, and there are a few out there. Um, there's like uh, uh, something kid. I can't remember what it's called. Hmm. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to remember or do a bit of Googling here. Um, can I think... ask an extension question of that question? Yeah. Sure. Most so... dogs can, can encode basic metadata though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I you use, use I mean, I, I've, I'm, I'm leaning more to, more and more towards studio one these days than pro tools. Um, and, and I found this whole project section of studio one that kind of like adds metadata and stuff. So, hmm. so uh, I, when you open up Spotify or title or Apple music, um, you, in a lot of cases, can see uh, the credits of written, produced, mixed, etc. Is does that get added in any kind of metadata, or is that physically added per song? Like somebody types it in. It's a good question. It's not in any files that we deliver as masters. Um, that shows so, up. Well, I'm there's sure. a couple places where that stuff lives. There's the Grace Note database. Um, which is uh, put in by the content owner. <clears throat> then oh there's God, also that's been around for years. Yeah, yeah. It's still, it's still, still around. Kicking. Um, and when we deliver masters from from the studio, um, what we do is send, of course, uh, a file name, um, a version usually. Uh, but then um, the distributor actually, the they're the sometimes they're called the aggregator folks like TuneCore, CD Baby, DistroKid, DistroKid, those mm -hmm. those folks that um, that actually like 
proliferate the files out into the world, um, they will ask for the artist or the uploader for new data. So they basically strip anything that we would have encoded regardless, they would have, they would strip that and um, put in their own metadata that actually gets pushed to those um, different servers. And fun fact, there, most of those um, companies like Spotify, Tidal, iTunes, all of them, they actually have manual human step through processes that wow. will go through and advance the file to the next stage to then wow. be eventually published. So all of them have a different amount of time that it takes once you upload your files from DistroKid um, that it will actually show up out on the internet. Sometimes it's a day two or two, sometimes it's a week or two, depending on the service. Huh. While we're talking about that, can I quickly plug how proud I am of you seeing your name on Apple Music's uh, new press yeah, release? Is a, pretty is a cool. This is cool Piper. stuff, Piper. It's pretty cool. Hi. That's Piper, by the way. It's Piper's name that's on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, next question. Next right. question. Oh my God, there's so many metadata questions. I don't want to ask too many of those. Do you want me to um, skip to a, a very oh, here's interesting one. Oh, you here's got one. It. What is Slate? Wait, we, <laughs> we did that one once already, but I'm well, curious. It is, I kind of get the I kind of get the feeling that somebody asks that question every time. Um, uh, a very cool plugin brand. brand. Uh, it, it's. Dang, I thought um, I'd get a little bit of contro controversy, as it would be said in your. No, in it, it's uh, one of the one of the interesting things about. Um, uh, I mean. Say, for example, uh, and I'm talking directly to everybody who's watching this right now. I do events on for Waves plugins, so I'm usually hosting these things, but I haven't done any in a few months, so this is the first time I'm in front of a camera for a while, which is really nice. But one of the things that nearly always comes up when an artist like Piper Payne or Andrew Sheps or CLA or anybody else comes on is... Do I have to pull all the other plugins from other companies out of my session? And my answer is generally no. And they're like, oh, but you can't show that. And I'm like, yeah, you can. Because the real world scenario is everybody uses a ton of different tools. Um, in the audio world, plugins are like paint colors and paint kinds uh, uh, like for an artist. So uh, Slate is one color of plugins. We are another. We have a lot more colors than Slate, but they're a different color. Um, uh, Steven's a friend of mine, so you know it's it, they they make some cool they make some cool tools. Good luck to them. Right on, Dan. You got a question for him? I do. I have a mastering question, and I'm just kind of okay. curious to see how both of you would answer this question. And I have a, an answer myself too. But how do you get? And I feel like this is a very basic question that everyone thinks when they first start uh, mastering records. How do you get all of the tracks to sound uniform in terms of loudness when mastering an album? The, the, the interesting thing about that question and how it's answered is, and Piper can help me with this one, but I seem to recall in my younger days in the industry that a lot of the times um, there was a, it was a lot more prevalent that one guy would be recording or mixing an entire album and then he'd send it to the mastering engineer. Now there could be several or more than several, if there is such a thing, I'm not a mathematician, uh, mixes, mixes working on a record and then sending them all to a mastering engineer. And therefore, different characters and different personalities mixing different tracks that someone like Piper then has to take and has the challenge of making them all sound like a cohesive project. But one of the things that Piper said to me once when I was interviewing Piper was one of the questions that has to be asked is, does the client actually want it to be a journey? Or is it, you know, I mean, what does the client want from this? Do, do they want a cohesive collection or do they want something different? Um, so that's the qu first question that has to be answered, which has nothing to do with plugins and everything to do with what the client wants, because they're always right. Yeah. 
They are. And, you know, a lot. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times the mixes come from lots of different places and they can't all be uniformly um, equal. And um, what we do at that point is I don't know about you, Dan, you can chime in, too, of course. But um, what I do is I find something that's common. Um, so a lot of times it's going to be the vocal level because if it's a vocal album, um, that's going to be the first thing that people want to reach for to turn it up and down. If it's, uh, like an EDM or a, you know, some sort of a, um, uh, you know, like a dance record, then you're probably going to focus on the bass and making sure that the bass feels the most uniform. And then everything else is kind of forgiven because you can't like loudness is all subjective. Like you can't, you can't really say like I, I like me listening in my studio might say like I think they all sound pretty uniform but then they might take it out to somebody else's place and it sounds different or <clears throat> you have different ears I have different ears so um uh, at that point what I would do is just anchor on something common to every uh track and try and make that feel equal right I had a really interesting conversation with Andrew Sheps uh a couple of months ago in what's going to be a new podcast for waves um and one of the questions i asked him was talk to me about the metallica album uh, that was that created such discussion such passionate discussion in the audio field about how loud it was and that was one of those times where we had an interesting discussion about okay so Talk to me about the process. Why was it so ridiculously discussed? And he was like, it's just what the band wanted. And that's what we sent to the mastering engineer. So they then had to deal with it. But mm -hmm. the band is, or, or whoever's making the decision for the band is, they're the client. So, you know, I did what they asked. And as simple as that. It's like people were blaming Andrew and you know, saying, oh, he mixed it differently, et cetera. It's like, no, the client is the client. Do it. Mm-hmm. And the record sounds cohesive, like totally sounds great. Um, and it is very loud, but um, ridiculously. But, yeah. um, but I, and I think for me, like the answer is definitely much more like Pi is, is very much along Piper's lines is is finding something um, unique or sorry, something uniform about the tracks to, to kind of glue to. But another thing I would say is don't get too caught up trying to really change a track, like especially if a mix sounds really good on its own, but let's just say the drums aren't as loud as the other songs. Don't be trying to do a whole bunch of processing to just bring the drums up because you, you might, uh, to the detriment of that mix, get rid of a lot of the cohesiveness of it itself. So a lot of it is is a bit of give and take and trying to find a good balance where this track can get to whatever level it needs to or whatever space it needs to to fit with everything without completely reimagining what it's supposed to be. Do you guys find sometimes that you're mastering things that the artist may have done months before uh, as part of a project and may have nearly forgotten about what it was supposed to sound like? Interesting. Huh. So, for example, it's like I've worked with a, f a few artists over the years who mm -hmm. we've spent like weeks trying to get through two or three tracks that have struggled and then we've sped through three or four more tracks mm -hmm. and then it's gone over to the mastering engineer and I remember seeing one specific artist in particular and it's no names here but this artist has had multiple number ones and they were like, that's not the way I remember it sounding and we actually went back to the mix and he was like, huh. Okay, cool. Not the way I remember it, but yeah, it sounds good. So, um, I mean, do you find ever that you have to remind someone of the mix that they actually sent? Yes, because the master changes sometimes. I mean, we obviously try and be as true to the mix as we can, but um, I, I literally just cut off the way I was like two minutes late to our little sound check because I was on the phone with a client and I had mastered a song back in December and then and delivered it and then he remixed it again in april completely forgetting that i had even mastered a version wow. of that and then i delivered that one and he was like wow this sounds like kind of bright like i'm not sure what's up with that was I, I was like well you sent me a really bright mix like it was the, this mix was brighter than the previous mix he was like i actually forgot that i sent you <laughs> right that track already That's interesting. It's like funny it's really funny, but you know, artists are artists are incredible animals, and I love them dearly. Um, it's just that sometimes we have to keep track of their stuff for them. Um, yeah, 
yeah, yeah we do and and it's but i i think one of the things that i remember you telling me piper was uh that at at the end of the day it's not your job to change the mix it's your job to get the best out of yes. a mix and enhance what's there and you you said to me once occasionally you have gone back and gone i suggest that you maybe do another mix with mm -hmm. this instrument up or down because of this specific reason. But um, you know, I'm not sure all mastering engineers would do that. Sometimes, but yeah, not all of them do. I don't know, yeah. Dan, do you ever send send comments back or request I, mixes when you need to? You know, I do if, um, if something is really problematic, I will reach out. In general, it, I try to fix it on my own first. Um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And if you know if that is unsuccessful, absolutely, I will. Yeah. I'm not shy um, to tell people to at well to politely request a change. If oh, yeah. I, th I think one of the biggest problems I've ever found with any um, artist that happens to work on their stuff before they bring it back to me is they listen to it too loud, and yeah. it's like everybody has this wonderful thing of it sounds everything sounds better when it's loud the problem is it, everything sounds great when it's loud but you can't differentiate between any frequencies yeah. but it sounds better if it's mixed at a low volume and then played loud which is why i have that <laughs> on, oh oh yeah on oh, oh, oh to the left there oh there Awesome. That's awesome that reminds me that uh, occasionally i have to actually turn it down <laughs> I love it. That's funny. Hey, Michael, I have a question um, here about uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. So you produce a lot of stuff. I know this. You, I know that you are a prolific producer. So you must have some software uh, controllers, some, some, some controllers in your studio there, some things like some MIDI keyboards. And I do. Like I that do. Um, um, so this person's asking about tips for having lots of different um, uh, best practices for having a lot of uh, hardware controllers and things. Not specifically like, you know, hardware gear, but... Um, but controllers, yeah. et cetera. Um, my, my biggest piece of advice is uh, a creative space is in a way a bit like a kid's bedroom. It's constantly evolving and you're constantly rearranging it. But at the end of the day, you have to actually be able to walk into it and smile. And when you walk out of it, turn around, look at it and smile and look forward to being there. And one of the things from my perspective that I find when it comes to being creative is clutter is your enemy. Um, so I have narrowed my life down to uh, one sixty-one key weighted keyboard. Um, sorry, one sixty-one key unweighted keyboard. Okay. Um, one thirty-two key keyboard that is literally right in front of me, and then uh, one mixing controller so that I have motorized faders. That's it. Every other keyboard is in the closet or has been donated to a school or boys and girls club, um, but is out of my life. Because unless I can actually physically look at something and go, this is the reason for this being here, mm -hmm. then it has to go. You can be a gear whore and that's fine, but it's a terrible place to be if you want to have a clean, creative space. I One of my oldest friends, a guy called Andy Bagley, who lives in Tasmania now, is a massive synth, synth collector. And his place looks like Thomas Dolby's, um, you know, heaven. It's like there are synths all the way up the wall, etc. That's the way his brain works. But those are specific hardware synthesizers that have specific sounds. Mm -hmm. When it comes to controllers, one small keyboard, one large keyboard, and a mixer. That's it. Everything else, get rid of it. That's my advice. Cool. Thank you. All right, Dan, what you got? Um, let's see. Let's, you know, I kind of want to give you another plug-in question here since we have, uh, since we have. Knock yourself out. Time. How about this one? How do you, as a company, decide what 
pieces of gear you're going to model or what plugins you're going to try and design in general? Um, we, so as, as a company, uh, we are, we were the ones who pretty much started third party plugins. We released the first ever third party plugin, which was the Q10. And that was in 1991. Um, and that's still one of the most used EQs to this day because it's good. It's really good. One of the things that Waves as a company has done for years and years and years has been to make decisions based on what's happening out in not so much the marketplace, what's selling or what's not selling, but what are people steering towards to use? What are people starting to pay attention to? And in a lot of cases, what do we feel people are actually going to be using in a few years' time? Because a plugin to go from the beginning of creation to when it's released could be two years to five years, um, or it could be a year, depending on how how much of the code we might already have for the base of it. So we try really, really hard to release things that we think people are going to be using a few years down the track. Uh, one of the perfect examples would be vitamin. Vitamin is what we call um, it's a it's it's an enhancer. You can take your know, your lows, your low mids, your high mids, your highs, and mono or stereo out those specific frequency ranges. Change the crossovers. Um, and move them around so that you actually are kind of separating the different EQs of a mix and stereoing or monifying different parts of it to recreate what's there. Um, that was kind of a weird thing to explain to people because people didn't really start using it until two years after we released it. Um, but that's kind of what we do we try to create things that are going to be the next tool center was another good one um we ended we created center for live sound and for mastering engineers and it's turned out to be in a great tool for mixes as well um piper you you you've used center haven't you yeah yes i love that one is that an elliptical filter center yeah. um Center lets you control the the side of a mix and the center of a mix so that you could – it doesn't let you it, – it's not like reversing the phase and pulling the vocals out in that kind of weird stereo phasey kind of way that drives me nuts. Um, but uh, from a mastering perspective or a mixer's perspective, if you end up being given a file that has one instrument, uh, whether it's a vocal or something else, that's too – high or too low in a mix, you have a certain control over the sides and the center so that you can try and bring it down or make something more present. Right. Um, at hmm. the end of the day, though, we spend a ton of time uh, going through the process of what do we feel people are going to be using tomorrow? Not hmm. today, but tomorrow. Um, and sometimes we'll create something and then we'll hold on to it for a while. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's not a huge company, but we put a ton of work and passion into this. We really do. So as, as a follow-up question then to that, and maybe you can't talk about it, but, um, are you also as a company looking into alternate formats such as Atmos and other immersive, immersive audio? Well, we have, I mean, it, it, it we, we already have that. Oh, you do. Um, do. we already have that. We have, we created a plugin about five, actually about five, seven years ago now called NX, um, which gives you the ability to have stereo speaker placement or 5.1 or 7.1 in a stereo pair of headphones. Oh, nice. We then took that one step further uh, uh, about two years ago and we released an, uh, a mod an extension of that NX Abbey Road Studio 3, which was a model in cooperation with Abbey Road of their Studio 3 with the uh, wall-mounted um, large monitors, their surround monitors, and their near fields, so that you could actually. And then we released another one at the beginning of this year, NX Oceanway. So we already have that when it comes to 
that kind of sound. And one of the things that makes it cool is when you're using, say, for example, headphones like these or these ones, it's kind of built into it. So the, 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 the movement of the placement of the speakers and the placement of the sound moves with your head. With your head, which yeah. Is, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, on top of that, though, we're still the industry standard when it comes to, you know, the surround bundle is a post-production must-have mm -hmm. for whether it's, uh, you know, C360 or uh, R360 or, you know, H Reverb 5.1. Um, when it comes to surround, uh, we're, we're still an industry standard. That's awesome. Um, slightly technical question, just, uh, and maybe you don't have the answer to this either, but, uh, is there any plan on waves updating for the M one chips for Mac and when we're, that be? we're always, okay. So for first things first, whenever it comes to anything that's being released by Apple, we get that information the same time everybody else does. Mm. Um, so, uh, when it comes to the M one, yes, absolutely. When, uh, as soon as we possibly can. Um, it's, it, it, I mean, we, it, it's kind of like, you know, Apple comes out with something or windows comes out with something. It's like, okay, so let's have a conversation and work out how to update that. Sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's really not. So perfect example was, uh, moving from Artaz and TDM to AAX, AAX. that, that took us a year to move all the plugins to AAX native, it was not easy at all. Michael, what are your favorite non-waves plugins? My favorite non-waves plugins would be, I really, really love, um, God, now I'm trying to remember what it's called. Uh, it's called, um, God, what's it called? Uh, BX Boom. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Uh, I love that plugin. <laughs> um, that that's 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 still a plugin I use a lot. Um, I really love the original plugins that Colin McDowell wrote for Pro Tools. Um, yeah, the DSP. There's there's something very uh, there's a really cool factor to. Um, uh, when I get to work on one of my older machines to bring back a session uh, to when I get to open up like EQ2 or EQ3 or uh, Dyne, Dyne 3, for Dyne, example. Yeah. From, those plugins have a certain character to them that just yeah. kicks ass. Um, and yes, to the person uh, who said that, that was Brainworks. So mm -hmm. that's a great plugin. Um, but yeah, Colin just, Colin writes some amazing stuff. He really does. Mm -hmm. He's such a smart dude. He's just um, such a beautiful human being. We are, you know what? Everybody pretty much in the audio industry is pretty beautiful now. I gotta say. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, pretty, we're pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah, we're pretty we're lucky. Prettier. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, it's now yeah. that uh, now that we've been here for about forty-ish minutes, it's probably a good idea to see if anybody has any other questions in the comments. So. This is obviously at this point not anonymous anymore, but if you guys have any specific questions. There is one question I can goal. see. Oh, yeah. somebody's, somebody's asking why, what is it about Studio One that I prefer over Pro Tools? Do you want me to answer that? Oh, yeah, answer yeah that. that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, there you go, James. Uh, James, nice. We are not sponsored by anyone, by the way, just FYI. Nice bridge shot. Um, uh, I got dragged into digital audio in the studio I was managing in Melbourne, Australia in 1997. Um, we got dragged into the digital realm with eMagic, Logic Audio, Silver and Gold, and then um, one of the first editions of what became Pro Tools. So I became very, very used to Pro Tools, the shortcuts, Apple E, Control E, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, but as it has evolved, it has tended to become a bit cumbersome when it comes to how much CPU it uses if you are doing very, very large sessions. So do I still use Pro Tools? Yes, I do. 
But if I have a session that has over 200 channels and video, I'm going to go Studio One because it uses about a quarter of the amount of CPU. Hmm. I, I also actually like the sound of the mix bus. And one of the things I think doesn't get talked about enough when you're talking about your choice of DAW is what it actually sounds like. There's a difference between the way Cubase sounds to Logic to Pro Tools to Studio One. There's a difference in those. And um, every single build sounds different. Exactly. And then, and then you get into the deeper ones. Like, I mean, I know Piper. Do, do some um, mastering engineers still lean on Nuendo? Yeah, um, yeah. Wave Lab more more so. I mean, Dan. Right. Uh, everybody at uh, Dan and I, I think, are the only. What ones. about Sequoia? So I've been Dan a Sequoia, Sequoia user, Sequoia user for years. I actually just switched this week to Wave Lab. This okay, is my yeah, first I was going to say Dan Lab, and I are the only so. ones that are like the holdouts at Infrasonic that are not using yeah. Wave Lab right now. I still use but, Sequoia for all of my QC work um, yeah. and just basic audio work because I'm so much faster mm -hmm. in it. But um, I'm trying to to switch over to yeah. Wave Lab. Yeah, Wave Lab's yeah. an incredible software. Um, so that's the that's the Steinberg mastering one. Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah, have that. I, I have I have this wonderful little. Um, kind of this little key here. And yeah. I, I realized that Wave Lab was on it, so I opened it up. I know nothing about it. I, I have no lack of pride saying that it looks pretty. It's 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 a little bit of a different <laughs> workflow. It's I mean, different. Like, like it's a different way of thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. And engineers like Dan and I that came up in Sadie and Soundblade. Um, are, Sadie. You know, like, oh my God. Sadie in the radio world. It, I mean, it, it's like in Australia. In the early 2000s, Sadie became a thing, and the company I was the I was managing the radio, all the radio station studios for a company called Austereo, and we were like, they were like, "Do you want to move to Sadie? Do you want to move to Sadie?" And I said, "We've invested so much in Pro Tools, mm. we're sticking with Pro Tools," and I'm really glad we did. I worked on Sadie for six and a half years. I think you're yeah. very glad. You're very yeah. lucky that you didn't. And uh, yeah. Funksta. <laughs> Uh, Funcusta. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, but um, they're talking about uh, the old Sonic Sonic Solutions Sonic pre mastering Solutions. days, and that's the stuff I came up on. Was yeah, uh, was me too. Soundblade, which was uh, the pre precursor to that, was Sonic Solutions. Funkster so. also just mentioned Harrison as well, which is oh, Harrison uh, sounds awesome. It does, and and Harrison is one of those ridiculous one of those ones where I actually thought it was a trick purchase. It's like it comes up. It's one of the mm -hmm. okay. I'm a people. I'm Australian. I drink, no. therefore, therefore I do make 3 a.m. drunk purchases. And uh, an email came in from Harrison. It's like buying mix mix for like some ridiculous amount of money. I was like, I'll do that. Um, and then four months later, I installed it. I'm sorry. You know, did it live it, up to it? It's expectations. It was, yeah, it really, really did. That's awesome. Really I did. used it because I had I I was kind of forced to, and um, uh, because Sequoia was not working on the machine I was on, and I ended up having to use Harrison Mixbus for captures, and it sounds freaking awesome. And that's also incidentally how I ended up using Reaper was because literally nothing else worked. Well, I didn't really pay attention to Reaper until you turned up at Nam, and you know uh -oh. you, you <laughs> right. You turned up at Nam, and you and I about to do a demo, and I said, "So you bring me a Pro Tools session?" And you said, "No, I'm bringing my own rig." And we plugged in Reaper, mm -hmm. and it was when I got home from that Nam, which is like four years ago, that I thought I should probably give Reaper a bit more attention. Um, Reaper's badass. It's um, cool. It's it's oh, it's very cool. It's very cool. Um, uh, uh, hmm, down under audio, do you expect great things from Fairlight in Resolve? That's actually a good question. So the question is, I don't even know what any of that means. What Car <laughs> Carmen, <laughs> Car what language that just happened there? <laughs> All right, can uh, Carmen, which uh, there we go. Okay, cool. Down under audio, down under audio is actually I'm gonna. I'm going to find that domain. Okay, so Piper and I tend to buy domains at 3 o'clock in the morning too. I'm going <laughs> to... Drunk domain buying. <laughs> we do that. It's an affliction. So, so I'm actually going to go and see if I can buy that domain name because down under audio sounds good. Okay. sell it to you. For so million. Fairlight. Fairlight, uh, for those of you who may have heard the term Fairlight and thought that sounds familiar, 
Fairlight was a system that was invented in Australia, and I actually beta tested some of the original ones at Albert Studios in Sydney in the late 90s. Um, and as a side of that, there was one specific week at, week at Albert's that I was messing around on a Fairlight system. ACDC was in Studio A, Crowded House was in Studio B, In Excess was rehearsing in Studio C, wow. and uh, and a, a dude called Colin Hay uh, and his band called uh, Men at Work were waiting in reception, and you had this this mishmash of Australian classic rock and everybody knew everybody and everybody was working together. And it was probably one of the greatest weeks of my life. But to the question, do you expect great things from Fairlight and Resolve? Yes, I really do. Um, firstly, uh, Da Vinci Resolve is kicking ass when it comes to NLEs, nonlinear video editing. It's like I use it for pretty much everything I do video. The fact that Fairlight is a part of it now is really good. Um, and the way that plug-in, plugins, third-party plugins integrate into that is even better. So yes, I do think uh, I do. I, I I'm very excited about the Fairlight Black Magic thing. So is Fairlight a DAW that will incorporate with that? Um, it's not really a door. It's like it used to be kind of a door plus hard. Well, mostly hardware plus door, but it, it ended up with. Black Magic integrating their kind of code and way of processing audio into their into NLE, and it does it really well. It really does. Hmm. Nice. Okay. What else have we got? Um, someone's asking what your favorite um, hardware um, interface is. Mine. Yeah. Um, my favorite hardware interface is actually quite an old one. I'm staring at it right now. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, a DigiDesign 192, oh. 16 by 16. Oh, yeah. And I have three of them and the, but this one I'm staring at right now, I've had since two, 2001 ish, wow. I think. Um, and, uh, it's moved, it's moved countries with me. It moved to, it moved from Australia here with me and, uh, I rely on it and I love it. And, uh, Avid sent me an HDIO and I listened to it and I was like, no, nah, don't want it. Thank you though. Appreciate it. Um, I love my, I love my, my 192. One of the things about hardware, as far as I'm concerned is if you, have a certain something that you love about a piece of hardware, even if you can't explain it, hold on to it, never get rid of it, because uh, you will regret it. Yeah. True. True it that. really is. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, another question. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> it, this is obviously for digital stuff. Um, what are some good ways to help set levels? One of the, I mean, from a mixing point, do you mean from a mixing point of view, do you think? Is, I mean, I'm it, waiting it, the, for... The question I, is mixing, um, but I actually read it more as recording. Yeah, that's okay. how I took it too. The, the beautiful thing about recording in digital is you, in, in one way, you can be lazier than you were when it came to analog. Having said that, one of the things I think that I'm grateful I brought from the analog world is the fact that I had to actually put some skin on the table and commit to a recording level when I was recording um, any kind of bands, um, especially ones that you knew were going to be on the radio fairly shortly because you didn't get a second chance. Now, that kind of decision-making coming into the digital realm sets you up to make sure that you know how to basically commit the the term fix it in the mix is probably one of my most detested terms and fix it in the mix usually comes up because somebody didn't put enough care into checking their levels on recording in mm -hmm. there are two things that i care about when i'm recording something number one is the gain enough so that uh, uh you know noise to signal ratio 
is all good. And if you know, if I'm going to put it through a compressor while I'm, because a lot of the time with the vocal, I'll actually put it through a compressor on the way in and actually commit to a certain dynamic range on the way in. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that I have both enough signal, but also enough freedom to move and headroom on uh, on the way out. So enough signal on the way in and enough on the way out. So you you ha I think, and I think one of the best ways to answer that question in a shorter way than the Australian way, which is the ten minute version I just mm -hmm. gave you, is have the balls to say to somebody if they're pushing you to hurry up. Please hold. I'm just confirming that I've got the right signal. We'll be ready in a second. And make sure you spend that extra 10 seconds or a minute making sure that you have a solid signal going in so that it's not going to distort, but it's uh, it, it's at a decent level. And by a decent level, it really does get determined by what the instrument is that you're actually and I, I had to try so hard then not to say those two words that I'm not supposed mm -hmm. to. I, saw I didn't say it, Dan. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't. But it, but it does in a way. You <laughs> the, the signal that comes in really is determined by what you're actually. There was a guy I was recording years ago. Uh, Google him. His name is Rick Price. A brilliant singer. Okay. Brilliant guitarist in uh, from Australia, never gets you never get a second chance because the first take is always perfect. The mm -hmm. guy is a freaking genius. So when I recorded every time I recorded Rick Price, I had to make sure that the level going in was the level that I really wanted because there was no take two, mm -hmm. um, and he was that was kind of my training ground in the early nineties on you really have to make sure that you commit even in digital people mm -hmm. watch my eyes commit mm -hmm. commit to a level do not try and fix in the mix and just and to your answer about the instruments i just a funny story from college was one time i was recording a tambourine and we were getting it to meter correctly but that tambourine was freaking loud compared to everything else because right. it's such a percussive and such a, uh, a transient instrument that the metering didn't always tell you the full story it was as loud as everything else but it was right. way louder sonically so you got to actually use your ears like you were saying just you really sure do uh, i mean and, right. and 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 when it comes to that, so Funkster or Funkuster uh, just asked, you know, favorite metering. The favorite metering is the metering that works for you. Um, I one of my favorite meters is, uh, you know, uh, Abbey Road Mastering Chain, um, mm -hmm. and the, the meter that meters. comes with it yep. because those meters that come with that plugin kick ass. Uh, However, we released a, 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 a meter called simply the VU meter uh, about f three or four years ago as a Black Friday free plugin. Um, and it comes with most bundles now. And VU meter is a really good meter as well. It's like a mini Duro. Huh. Um, and then, of course, the Duro meters. But the best meter is, the, I mean, th there's nothing wrong a lot of the times with the meters that you get in your DAW as long as you know what you're actually looking at understand what you're actually looking at so that you, you're you not just looking at levels going up and down and hoping it doesn't go into the red. That doesn't quite cut it. <laughs> you want to make sure that you understand what those numbers mean, uh, even on a basic level, so that you have an idea of what you're actually getting. Funkster's asking a lot of questions. He's full of questions, which is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So Q is okay. K, Funkster. There you go. We were yeah, right, Piper. Funksta. Yeah, Funkster. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we on, did have a couple of uh, inputs to our form um, during this do it. discussion. Um, and I'm not. I'm just going to read them to you right out of my email here because I'm not really sure what they mean. But um, uh, this one says um, relative track levels for individuals. This, this looks like it's a, uh, an answer to something we talked about very, at the very beginning here about um album album sequencing mm -hmm. relative track levels for individual tracks on an album is generally a follow-on to sequencing tracks though this plays into mpa's mention of story or term to that effect uh the maximum perceived level wars 
that challenge any track that will show up on a streaming service may mean the album mastering should be independent from the quote single deliverable due to this reality. And yes, we do talk about that um, a lot when we when we have to do a single ahead of time and then have to remaster that song for um, for the album that will it will often change. Um, and then lastly, uh, we had another one come in here. It says the any DAW direction might need qualification on dither implementation, even if the deliverable is 24 bit. And yes, I absolutely agree with that. Oh, I do too. Uh, and that, that also adds on to, um, have a listen to what the mix bus of a DAW sounds like as well, mm -hmm. which I think I mentioned earlier, it, you could extend that to more than I just like the way, I mean, I have a, a friend in Miami, Chris Rodriguez, who mixes a lot and spends most of his time in the, the Billboard dance charts at the very top. Um, and, you know, everybody's always freaked out by the fact. It's like, oh, my God, you don't do anything in Pro Tools. You do everything in Cubase. And he goes, not only that, he spent half his career doing it in Reason. Huh. Uh, the simple fact is Chris knows exactly what he's going to get out of Cubase, so therefore knows how to mix through it because he knows his tools. And this then comes back to the the answer I gave earlier on, which is make sure your, D, your DAW, I can't say door. I've never been able to say door. A door is something you walk through. It's not something I do. Me so, And that's probably because I don't have an American accent. Well, Australians don't have accents. Um, Famously. Um, well, well, it's like porn and porn. It's like, I mean, yeah, it's like P-A-W-N in Australian is porn. P-O-R-N is also porn. You know how many problems that's created for me over the years over here? Yes, oh, you, in Imagine. your chess career. Yeah, exactly. Where did you get that guitar? From a porn shop. What were you doing in there? And did they Why sell did they guitar? guitar? So, so um, but, but it comes down to knowing, making sure that your DAW is working for you and you're not working for it. And a lot of that has to do with just understanding exactly what the output of it is. Yes. And, and, and making, testing it, to making sure that it's exactly. using different options, listening, listening in depth, just general good things to do as an engineer. And Tony Maserati said to me um, on, a, a, on an open sessions masterclass we did, you can find it on waves.com. Um, one of the things he said was uh, he spends uh, about an hour every couple of weeks, an hour or two every couple of weeks, just literally going through his plugin list and messing around with things and working out what some of the toys he has do. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the answer, the comments when when he said that on the, the the live stream, some of them were kind of like, well, you know, he's a star. He has every plugin known to man. I'm going to argue with that and say every single one of us has more plugins than we use. Yeah. Every single one of us. If you count the plugins that you have in your your software that come with it built in, uh, as some people refer to, I think, as stock plugins, and then the ones that you might have bought from Waves or other companies. Most of us have an awful lot of tools. And I remember I walked into a, a studio that I've worked in a lot over the years in Detroit called Gold Sound, back when they had 13 rooms, all running Icon um, uh, consoles, all running Mercury bundles, mm -hmm. and they just upgraded to Mercury bundles. And this is back when they were TDM and they were thirteen and a half thousand dollars each. I remember, yeah. Right. So Brian Gold had literally bought thirteen of these these Mercury bundle upgrades and spent a ridiculous amount of money that had made me think, oh, I wish I got commission. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I had said to his team at the time when I flew into Detroit, when I come back in a month, I'm going to make a prediction. And that is that you are still using the five plugins that you've been using for the last year. They were right. like, no, no, no. We have every plugin known to man. We're going to be using everything. I, ca I guarantee you, you're wrong. Unless you actually commit the time to work out what some of those tools do. Um, the, there's this want that we have, and I'm totally fine with it. We sell plugins, um, but I do, as a creative person, want to make sure that you understand that you have a lot of tools. Make sure that the ones that you have as your, you know, your kind of like 
your banners of what your work that you use in your work are the ones that actually really work for you. I love it. Words to live by. Um, Michael, thank you so much. Are we just blown by? Wow, are we done? You're out of cider. And, um, Actually, no, I've got a third bottle here. All right. <laughs> so perfect timing then for you to join us on the Discord. Um, the, uh, I'm on Discord. Perfect. So um, we are going to pick this up uh, over on Discord. And Can you send, send me an invite to the Discord and, and I'll... The link, make... uh, Music Expo dropped that in the, in the, um, the comments here. I see um, that, yeah. Uh, I know you hi you hid them, but um, they're they're up, uh, and I just wanted to first of all thank you, Michael, for um, joining us today. Oh my god, um, it's been fun! And thank you, Dan, my illustrious co-host. Absolutely, um, thank you, Piper. My safety net and my <sighs> eyes on the on the uh, the questions here, um, and of course, thank you to uh, the Music Expo team, Loic. Carmen, Zell, um, y'all are awesome, and we definitely could not do this without you guys. Um, so join us over on the Discord. We'll be over there hanging out for a little bit, and um, we'll be able to see your beautiful faces because you've been looking at ours for the last hour. Can I have um, a final say? In a moment. <laughs> you can't ask for the final say with sandwiched in between two mastering engineers. We get the. Final I mean, that's say. true. <laughs> <laughs> I totally. I mean, you can. can ask. <laughs> you can ask. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're gonna go over and, and chat over there for a little bit so that we can let go of this stream um, and uh, get to know you guys all a little bit better and um, and see how we can help you. But we really appreciate you tuning in tonight and giving us your time and your attention. This happens every first Thursday of the month, and sometimes it's just me and Dan. Sometimes we uh, bring in an awesome guest like Michael P.A. from Waves over here. Um, and uh, I'm going to let him have the final word for once. For once. One of the things that I find that makes this kind of forum, no stupid audio questions, amazing, is that nearly every single one of us in the creative world has some form of imposter syndrome. We all feel like we're uh, not good enough or we, you know, can't speak up because somebody might know more or there's somebody who plays better guitar or somebody who sings better or somebody who mixes better. All of it comes down to the fact that in my career, there is not one thing I've achieved without going, what the hell? I'll just say, yes, I can do that uh, and then worked out how. Perfect example is there is a guitar, there it is, on the wall behind me. Mm -hmm. So um, that guitar, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's <laughs> so that guitar, I'll lean down. So that guitar, uh, I was assistant at a studio in Sydney and um, the senior engineer was off sick and I get a phone call from the receptionist and she's like, there's a man in reception and he needs to see the mix engineer. So I come out and he looks at me, this big six foot guy in a suit. And he goes, are you the mix engineer? I go, yes. And he goes, uh, we have a last minute session. Can you do it? And I'm like, yes. And he hands me a piece of paper with a rider. And that was the first time I realized what the hell a rider was. So for a session? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a big guy, huh? This is nineteen ninety um nineteen ninety two. Wow, back in the nineteen hundreds. Man. Yeah, back in the nineteen hundreds. So and he goes, uh, I'll be in with the artists in an hour and a half. And I hear this knock on the door and Jimmy Page walks in. And then Robert Plant walks in. And my butt cheeks clenched and <laughs> I thought, and I thought, have I got myself into uh, too much of a deep shit here? And the simple fact was that I literally just looked at them and went, okay, what are we doing? And uh, I just went for it. But I, I remember looking at Robert Plant going, I'm just the assistant. And I remember him looking back at me and going, you're not the assistant today. You're my mix engineer. 
Hell I'm yeah. a recording engineer. That's badass. And I spent and I spent three hours with Robert Plant sitting next to me and me tweaking uh, an Eventide 3000B harmonizer, harmonizer with him singing oh oh into a microphone until we got the right echo on his vocal. And then the reason for the guitar is Jimmy Page ran out of strings and ran out of guitars, and I'd bought a guitar from a music shop two days earlier from the Bondi Music Horn, uh, horn Shop. No, a real Bond music shop, shop, Bondi Beach Music <laughs> Headquarters. And I bought this guitar because I thought I'd learn how to play guitar. And he goes, whose is that guitar in the corner? He goes, it's mine. And he goes, can I play it? And I go, there's shit in the woods. <laughs> um, and unbeknownst to me, he signed it for me um, before he put it back in the bag. And I didn't realize it until two weeks later when I opened it. And I had it lacquered. And I have that guitar on my wall, not because I'm a big show-off dick, because it re helps remind me that the only way that I've ever moved any little step in my life is by saying yes to things that I don't necessarily have full confidence that I know how to pull off and until I've said yes. And so, that was the day that I called you and said, will you do no stupid audio questions? And now I regret it. But uh, <laughs> So, so ignore imposter syndrome. Just do it. Music is fun. Music is supposed to be fun. So make sure that you're enjoying it. But say yes to everything and just do it. That's oh, a great man. story. Yeah. Dude, I love you. Why can't we do this like every night? Yeah, I'd be drunk. Because we, we have work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is an awesome story. Thank you, Michael, for sharing no, that it's, and, it's, and uh, the message. I, I think it's a message mostly. It's uh, it's just 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 do it. it. Don't 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 be scared about what people will think. Everybody has to start somewhere. Just do it. That's awesome. awesome. Wow. wow. All right. Well, I don't know how to even close off after that. That was that was amazing. I, come hang out with. I told us you I didn't have the last word. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Michael. Absolutely, uh, it's been a blast having you here. That's been a Thank blast you. being here. Let's yeah. head over to the Discord, everybody. Let's do it. We'll see you all there. Um, go over to the – so follow that link. Um, maybe we can pop that in at the very bottom of the chat here one more time, please. Will I get my camera right over Somewhere. There it is. There you go, Discord. There we go. Um, so grab that link real fast, and you can actually find us in the, um, the Emmy Lounge. Um, once you're actually in the Discord, uh, the conversation will start over there. ME Mastering see. Engineer Lounge, not ME. Is that it? -E -M -M -E. You know what I love about this Discord? There isn't a picture of it with <laughs> graphics on my face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Danya's, Danya approves. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys. All you crazy kids. We'll see you over there on the Discord for a little bit. Um, much love. And, much love, uh, people. Go refill your drinks. And if not, we'll see you in a month. Hours. Yes, thank you. You only right. do this every month? Every Only month. month? Once a month. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> All right.